I did this morning with Jean, I'm going to tell just a quick story uh, about my experience with Jennifer Fletcher. I was, uh, in my second year of teaching, I somehow got myself into teaching AP language and composition, thinking like that would be fun and nobody else wanted to do it. And then I was an English literature major in college and so I was like, I don't know how to teach kids to write arguments, <laughs> like what, how am I supposed to do this? Um, so in th those early years, I had a couple of resources that like saved my life and one of them was this book, Teaching Arguments that I was so, it was like easy to find because it's still on my bookshelf um, by Jennifer Fletcher, which you probably know. And then last year I found out, again I think from Tanya, uh, Jennifer had a new book coming out, we were going to do an NWP radio show, and so I got the pleasure of getting a copy of this book and reading it. And as I was reading it, and in the months after and, and since then, I find myself all the time saying to teachers, oh my gosh, you have to read Jennifer Fletcher's book. And so I'm saying to all of you, you have to read this book. There is so much in here that's really beautiful and powerful about empowering students' voices and honoring um, their perspectives and, and really um, helping them build their identities as writers who get to make choices about the things that they do in their writing. So I am very excited and pleased to be able to welcome and introduce our keynote speaker. Jennifer Fletcher, and I will pass it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. And how's the sound? Can you hear me OK? Yeah, perfect. Um, that was lovely. Uh, I, I am so happy and thankful to be here with you today. This is my second in-person conference in two years. And it is the first time I have traveled outside of California for a conference since 2019. And I have to say, um, it, it's a little intimidating to be presenting to um, a group of such expert teacher leaders, but this is also such a tremendously caring community that I, I feel like I'm among friends. Um, so I'm also a, a huge fan of the writing project. I love everything that NWP does, um, and it's just a great honor to be speaking you, to you today. So I'm Jennifer Fletcher. I'm a professor of English at California State University, Monterey Bay. We are a small, comprehensive university on the central coast of California. I work with first-year students and also future English teachers. I'm a parent of teenagers. I've got an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old. I am a former high school English teacher. I taught AVID, AP Lit, AP Lang, and all of that informs my understanding of post-secondary success. I also work with teachers throughout California and in several other states as part of Cal State University's rhetoric-based literacy initiative. And first, I, I want to start with a vision of what we want for our students. And, and I think we all want students to have the ability to have the skills, the knowledge, and habits of mind to act as adaptive, independent problem solvers and effective communicators. And the ability to critically examine ways of knowing draw warranted conclusions from evidence, and practice open-minded inquiry. And I, I was hearing in the sessions that I attended this morning um, how this community is, is powerfully enacting these goals. So our agenda, we have three parts. Teaching rhetorical thinking, teaching argument as shared inquiry, and then teaching argument as rhetorical action. And we're going to focus on teaching rhetorical thinking first. So these are the big ideas I want you to keep in mind. The more choices students make as writers, the more knowledge they build of how writing works. And rhetorical knowledge helps students compose diverse texts across diverse contexts. Writing rhetorically, and including writing arguments rhetorically, 
is writing with authentic audiences, purposes, and contexts in mind. E. Shelley Reed, who is a professor of composition, says that this means paying attention to the needs of the author and the needs of the reader, rather than the needs of the teacher or the rules in the textbook. Okay, stay with me for a moment. How many of you added houseplants to your home in the last couple of years? Okay, me too. Um, <laughs> take a moment and read this description of caring for plants. Hey, are you good? This is another way of articulating the goal I'm pursuing. I want to support students in becoming the kind of person who can figure out how a system works and then experiment within it so that they can succeed in a variety of dynamic situations. And that's something that can be really challenging for learners at the novice stage. This is something else that I was hearing about in the sessions this morning, that the differences between novices and expert learners. The next slide you're gonna see is a reflection from one of my students who talks about the challenge of writing a grant proposal for the first time. This is something that she had never done before. Take a look. Okay. And those of you in the back, are you able to read okay? Okay, thank you. You will find the slide deck um, in the Google um, Doc that Jean so helpfully created. So this sounds familiar. <laughs> Probably sounds familiar from our own experiences as writers too. My, my starting place is always unmitigated cluelessness. Uh, and, and, you know, being confused doesn't mean that the teacher didn't provide a clear enough outline or template to follow. There are lots of real world starting places in, uh, excuse me, writing situations in which the default starting place is confusion and frustration, right? We can help students grapple with confusion and complexity by teaching the process of rhetorical decision-making, because rhetorical knowledge, that special kind of knowledge, is what helps students to understand how the system of communication works and then experiment within it. We're going to go shopping, <laughs> uh, virtually or imaginatively. This is a low-stakes activity that I use with my students to introduce rhetorical thinking. And you'll hear me talk about um, rhetorical thinking a little bit more than like classical rhetoric. It, it's not so much that we're kind of going back to Aristotle and, and Plato and all of that as we are thinking in terms of situational awareness and responsiveness. That's what rhetorical thinking is about. And if rhetoric is a newer term for you, I'm going to share a few definitions for that as well. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're choosing work of art for your home. You're, you're going to pick a particular room that you think one of these pieces of art would fit in. Um, I'm going to give you some options. And as you consider your choices, I'd like you to think about these questions. Which work of art would you choose for which room in your home? You might even want to like visualize which wall it would go on. What purpose would this work serve in this space? And what's your criteria for selecting an image? Okay, I've got those kind of basic rhetorical questions in mind. Here are your options.
When you're ready, go ahead and write down the number of the painting that you would like. And also the, the room you'd want to put it in. I'm going to move you to the next slide and then I'll bring you back to the paintings so you can talk about them at your table. But here's what you're going to talk about. Same questions. Which work of art would you choose? Or which room? What purpose would the work serve in this space? And what was your criteria for selecting that image? Okay? Ready? Go ahead and talk at your table, please. Okay, take a minute more. Okay, and let me bring us 
back together. Uh, let's do a quick room survey. I'm going to ask you to hold up the number of fingers corresponding to the painting you'd like to take home with you. So if you want number five, hold up five fingers. Okay, keep them up and everybody look around the room, see what kinds of choices people are making. I am seeing lots of fives, fours, ooh, fives and fours, ones, twos, any threes out there? Okay, there are some threes. Okay, very interesting. Thank you so much. So, you talked about your criteria. Now let's reverse engineer this and get at some principles of rhetorical thinking. So what do we learn about audience context and purpose from shopping for art? And I'm going to ask, um, Rachel has a mic, so if you've got a response, what, what kind of insights are occurring to you? What's the takeaway lesson from this kind of introductory activity? Good morning. There may be a targeted audience or a certain field of mood they're trying to project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Others? I'm sorry, a context, I think it's kind of like, you know, you asked us, you know, where would it be, what setting is it in, but in reality, I think that we try to explain the context as well. So explaining, realizing that you kind of have to explain context is pretty huge. What, what, there was not one item that appealed to all of us. And so, like a formula didn't work. I can go home now. I'm done. Some of us chose the same photo, but we all had a different purpose behind, like, it had a different intention, even though it was the same photo, and that was cool. Okay, any other? So I, I love that, and you know, you, you may have wanted to have taken all five pieces home with you if you had enough different spaces in your home for them. Um, we learn, for example, these are the, the key principles, that kind of system level knowledge, that we're using our own theory of visual rhetoric in making choices like this. We're, we're guided by principles of how context impacts purpose and how different audiences have different reactions. So that kind of system level understanding is what helps learners adapt and apply their knowledge in new context. In other words, that's the kind of deep thinking that promotes transfer of learning. Remember that one of the big ideas that I shared with you is that rhetorical knowledge helps students write diverse texts across diverse contexts. It's, it's that rhetorical thinking that helps students to keep repurposing what they know and can do, right? Like I did it this way here, then I'm gonna change it up a little bit, I'm gonna do it this way here, I've gotta make it work in the new situation, I've gotta research the new situation to make sure what I'm transferring is relevant and applicable in that new situation. So we're going to see how this decision-making process works when we change the purpose and context. We're now going to be choosing a piece of art for a hospital waiting room. And, and by the way, I have to say, I got uh, this idea partly from Thomas McCann. You'll hear a little bit more about the backstory um, in a few slides. Similar questions, right? A little more specific. Okay, are you ready? Here are your choices now. Go ahead and turn and talk to someone near you. Which of these is the best choice for a hospital waiting room?
waiting room. And they... Uh, Okay, start wrapping up what you're saying. I want to share a model of how real people made this decision. I've, I've heard the word authentic multiple times today, right? Um, uh, by the way, um, you may have wanted more information than I gave you. If you found that you were talking with your colleagues and were like, okay, but, but which room in the hospital? Hospital waiting room? Waiting room in which part of the hospital, right? Is, is, this, is this in the maternity ward or pediatric care? Because if it is, that might impact the decision that we're going to make. Um, so I'll tell you, um, the, this activity is based on a, a real world rhetorical problem solving situation um, from my community. An artist was commissioned to paint a picture for the Natividad Hospital and Trauma Center um, in Salinas. And uh, if you are a fan of John Steinbeck, you might recognize that image there of the Salinas Valley. It's, it's in Monterey County, where I live. Um, and the, the folks making this decision, again, considered these similar kinds of questions about audience and purpose. So this is what hospital administration said in an article for the Monterey County Weekly, that um, they choose colors for art in the hospital according to color psychology, in the waiting area for surgery patients. It's calming colors like greens and blues. How many of you talked about colors and the effect of colors? Okay, and in fact, Let's go back for a moment and get a room survey. Let's find out which one you would choose. Um, again, hold up the number of fingers for the number of the painting you would select. OK, keep your hands up. Look around the room again. This time, lots of twos. I see four, one. Lots of one. There's lots of ones over here, lots of twos over here. Lots of ones over here. That is very interesting. OK. Um, anyone for five? <laughs> okay. Why not? <laughs> Volcanoes are so calming. Come on. So that's what hospital administration said. And then here's what the artist, Enid Rice, said about her painting. What I hope different viewers will feel when they see their work is I hope they'll feel cared about and cared for. Whether they're a patient at the hospital who's waiting for an appointment or a loved one who is there to support a patient or who is taking some time to reflect or if they're a worker at the hospital who has to sometimes deal with difficult situations that the artwork is a peaceful space for them to feel nourished by the color and light in the works. This is the actual painting. It's called Fog. And Enid Rice, who's a faculty member at my university, 
talked about, so she worked at um, an art and cultural center over in Salinas, and this is what she would see on her, her drive-in every day, right? This is the morning commute and that feeling of the fog kind of, it, Monterey, if you've, if you've been to um, Central Coast in California, I feel like we have different colored clouds from just about anywhere I have seen in the world. And you've got this kind of purple fuzzy blanket that's, that's just kind of sitting on you much of the time, um, especially in the summer. Let's listen to Rice again. The question is what problem or need do I see the artwork addressing? And I came to this project right after spending a lot of time with my mother while she was in the hospital and she was dying. And the hospital did not have any artwork on the walls or any peaceful spaces for me to take a moment and walk or try to gather my thoughts or process what was happening. So when I had the opportunity to create something loving and site specific and celebrating Salinas and creating a space for people at the hospital to feel cared for, I was excited to have that opportunity. I hope that it helps. As Rice notes, visual rhetoric creates real effects on people and our world. And in, in this case, can be an important source of comfort during a difficult time. So what we just did was to practice a transferable process for rhetorical decision making. This is that system level knowledge that helps us to break free from rules and formulas, whether we're choosing art for a public space, or writing an argument essay. We know we're going to analyze the rhetorical situation, discover the best available means of persuasion, and make choices based on audience, purpose, and genre. Okay, part two. We talked about rhetorical thinking. We're now going to talk about argument as shared inquiry. Here are the big ideas I'd like you to focus on. Argument is a tool for shared inquiry. We do the work together with other writers in the conversation. Writing is a social activity. And inquiry-based arguments start with questions, not claims. I want to argue that the way we teach argument has the capacity to impact our students' um, abilities to collaborate, um, solve problems, and also their way of being in the world. I've been strongly influenced by models of cooperative argumentation developed by scholars like Justina McCo and Debbie and Marty, and really appreciate how that non-combative approach expands the inquiry space. When we're not feeling defensive, it's easier to consider new perspectives and new evidence that, that can change how we think. So many of you are probably fans of Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein's popular book, They Say, I Say. Take a look at what they say. If we're not practicing argument as inquiry, we might be doing something that's skipping ahead to just restating something that we already believe. We're, we're kind of going through the motions to create the form of an argument without enacting the full inquiry process that produces arguments and authentic disciplinary context. I want to share a quotation from an article now by uh, your National Writing Project leaders, including the brilliant Rachel Baer. Uh, take a look at what uh, Rachel and Linda and Tom say.
I see nodding heads. Um, I find this a really lovely description of the inquiry process. And I want to echo that the importance of engaging multiple perspectives and multiple pieces of evidence. Rhetorician John T. Gage talks about argument writing as a journey into the realm of ideas. The journey starts when we find an intriguing problem to solve. Feeling confused or uncertain um, about what a situation means or what's happened or, or what we should do is actually a sign that we're on the trail of something good, right? Um, like the pulsing blue dot on a Google map that marks the start of a journey, confusion tells us when we've found a problem worth investigating. We can reassure students that they're on the right path by studying models of inquiry. So um, by studying models, we, we can learn how working writers and researchers do their work, um, including how they test their ideas, analyze the evidence, and ask follow-up questions. We're going to be watching a short clip from Susan Simard's TED Talk, How Trees Talk to Each Other, in just a moment as a model of, of reasoned inquiry, or, or kind of the, the research that ultimately leads to the argument that she makes. Um, Susan Simard, uh, any of you know her work already? Um, OK, cool. Uh, any scientists in the room? OK, maybe some disciplinary folks. Um, she's a professor um, in the Department of Forest and Conservation Sciences at the University of British Columbia. And on the next slide, after this one, you're going to see an excerpt from her book in which she talks about her motivation for doing this research that I find really compelling. And she talks about uh, her discoveries um, about the, what's known as the wood wide web <laughs> that connects trees to each other and allows them to share information and resources. OK, here's what she says in her book. Take a look. OK, powerful, right? Inquiry often starts from a need or a problem, but then it is sustained by intense curiosity, not knowing something, and being like really motivated by what you don't know um, is also motivating for research. So I pose questions like these to my students when we study models of inquiry. We're looking at process. We're looking at the questions she asks the sources of knowledge, including kind of both like knowledge of her family background, knowledge like personal experience, um, as well as her formal training as an academic. And then really looking at how in this example, the conclusions are drawn from the patterns in the evidence. So we're going to take a look at the model. And think about those questions as you watch the clip. Imagine you're walking through a forest. I'm guessing you're thinking of a collection of trees, what we foresters call a stand with their rugged stems and their beautiful crowns. Yes, trees are the foundation of forests, but a forest is much more than what you see. And today, I want to change the way you think about forests. You see, underground, there is this other world, a world of infinite biological pathways that connect trees and allow them to communicate and allow the forest to behave as though it's a single organism. It might remind you of a sort of intelligence. How do I know this? Here's my story. I grew up in the forests of British Columbia. I used to lie on the forest floor and stare up at the tree crowns. They were giants. 
My grandfather was a giant too. He was a horse logger, and he used to selectively cut cedar poles from the inland rainforest. Grandpa taught me about the quiet and cohesive ways of the woods, and how my family was knit into it. So I followed in Grandpa's footsteps. He and I had this curiosity about forests. And my first big aha moment was at the outhouse by our lake. Our poor dog Jigs had slipped and fallen into the pit. So Grandpa ran up with his shovel to rescue the poor dog. He was down there swimming in the muck. But as Grandpa dug through that forest floor, I became fascinated with the roots. And under that, what I learned later was the white mycelium, and under that, the red and yellow mineral horizons. Eventually, Grandpa and I rescued the poor dog. But it was at that moment that I realized that that palette of roots and soil was really the foundation of the forest. And I wanted to know more, so I studied forestry. But soon I found myself working alongside the powerful people in charge of the commercial harvest. The extent of the clear cutting was alarming, and I soon found myself conflicted by my part in it. Not only that, the spraying and hacking of the aspens and birches to make way for the more commercially valuable planted pines and firs was astounding. It seemed that nothing could stop this relentless industrial machine. So I went back to school, and I studied my other world. You see, scientists had just discovered in the laboratory in vitro that one pine seedling root could transmit carbon to another pine seedling root. But this was in the laboratory, and I wondered, could this happen in real forests? I thought, yes. Trees in real forests might also share information below ground. But this was really controversial, and some people thought I was crazy. And I had a really hard time getting research funding. But I persevered. And I eventually conducted some experiments deep in the forest. 25 years ago, I grew 80 replicates of three species, paper birch, Douglas fir, and western red cedar. I figured the birch and the fir would be connected in a below-ground web. But not the cedar, it was in its own other world. And I gathered my apparatus, and I had no money, so I had to do it on the cheap. So I went to Canadian Tire, <laughs> and I bought some plastic bags and duct tape and shade cloths, a timer, a paper suit, a respirator. And then I borrowed some high-tech stuff from my university, a Geiger counter, a scintillation counter, a mass spectrometer, microscopes. And then I got some really dangerous stuff. Syringes full of radioactive carbon-14 carbon dioxide gas, and some high-pressure bottles of the stable isotope carbon-13 carbon dioxide gas. But I was legally permitted. <laughs> oh, and I forgot some stuff, important stuff: the bug spray, the bear spray, the filters for my respirator. Oh well. A little bit. In the transcript, um, and you should have copies of the excerpt from the transcript for the TED Talk on your table. So um, if you want to follow along, find where Simard says, I waited an hour. So this is that key experiment she conducts. And let's see, we've got, it, raise your hand if you need a copy of the transcript. Thank you, Tanya. Because using the transcript as the text provides students with a, a mentor text of the inquiry process, right? It's a, it's a way to surface that procedural knowledge and, and really get you know, a, under the, the surface, which is maybe especially appropriate given what Simard studies, to, to look at how the way things work, how, how they're connected, how you actually get from like evidence to claim to ultimate conclusion. So in this transcript, take a look and just see what you notice from this section.
Okay, even at just that first glance, you're probably noticing all the language about inquiry and reasoning, maybe about qualifiers, the word maybe, uh, transitions that relate to sequencing, um, and then the, the sense of excitement of discovery too, of, of inquiry actually changing what we know and understand. If you continue reading the transcript, you'll see more description of Simard's discoveries. So I like to use this as a way to really make that process visible for students and, and to give them kind of a behind the scenes look of what this thinking is like. Simard asks, um, how do I know what I know? And then tells us her story. Uh, like the fungal networks that Simard studies, arguments also develop from complex connections. And an argument map, and I imagine many of you have used argument maps, um, an argument map is a kind of story of the inquiry process. It charts the pathways leading from evidence to conclusions. When alternative perspectives are also included in the map, it gives us a sense of the social world and cultural context that the argument engages as well. So of course, here you have a map, and the green boxes down at the bottom are for an alternative perspective. What starts with questions, confusion, concerns maybe, and curiosity develops into a complete and complex argument. So in the case of Susan Simard, that overarching claim of, of trees talk to and cooperate with each other. Next in the map, we have claims that support Simard's overarching thesis. But we also have that new branch for an alternative perspective. You heard a little bit about this in the TED Talk, that this work was really controversial at the start. And um, that idea of, you know, like once one question is answered, it opens up space for other questions to be pursued. So even if there's agreement now about, okay, yes, the scientific community says, we see trees sharing resources and information. Simard describes this as cooperative and, and goes even farther, talks about it as being um, nurturing and indeed maternal. So other scientists might still be saying, okay, we agree this is happening, but uh, I'm not sure the relationship is cooperative. Maybe it's competitive in nature. Maybe it's more like, you know, parasites taking resources for each other, rather than being like mothers nurturing their children. So we continue to build the argument out, adding subclaims onto claims, and then finally the evidence upon which those claims are based. And, and even though I've, I've done it backwards this way, I, I want to or, emphasize that there's an order of operations in evidence-based reasoning, that, that we reason from evidence to claims, right? The, the question we ask early in the process is not, how can I go find some support for my claim, but rather, you know, what conclusions can I draw from the story the evidence tells? Okay, one of my students wrote an interesting reflection on going through this process himself, including kind of how, how challenging it was to start, and also his fear of being wrong, and I think that's one of the things to kind of, uh, you know, offer full disclosure around with inquiry-based approaches. You, you've got, you know, more false starts, there's more trial and error, it's not as efficient and straightforward as, you know, students or even we might like it to be, but that, that is the nature of the work, so kind of embracing that mess is one of the ways we get to those deeper understandings. So here's what he wrote, take a look. Practicing argument as inquiry, 
often calls for a big shift in thinking and, and really for additional encouragement and support for students who, who are going through these kinds of initial frustrations. And in the materials for this session, you'll, you'll find more forms of support for students. So I've shared like a graphic organizer for doing a claim analysis that gets kids thinking about um, you know, what are the connections between evidence um, and reasoning, um, what is the social context for the argument, what's the degree of certainty, um, and, it, and does that without telling students like what they have to say and do. It's a, it's a brainstorming tool rather than a, a product-based graphic organizer. Okay, so part three. In this final section of my talk, I want to focus on teaching argument writing as rhetorical action. A rhetorical situation is a situation that can be changed by rhetoric. To make effective changes, we have to know uh, what needs to be done, right? What, you know, what, what questions to answer, what problems to solve, and what other people have already done to work on the issue. Uh, we need to understand the cares and concerns of the people involved. So these are the final big ideas I want to share. Argument writing is a form of rhetorical action. And effective rhetorical action depend, or excuse me, respects the beliefs, needs, and contributions of stakeholders. My colleague, Midrella uh, Mascarenas, who is a professor of rhetoric and communication ethics at my university, has a really concise definition of rhetoric that links these ideas. And if this whole time you've been kind of thinking, yeah, but what is rhetoric? Um, I have an answer for you. Here's what it is. Nice and, and so memorable and, and student friendly. Um, it's about action. Rem rhetoric is eminently practical. It is goal focused and instrumental. Uh, rhetorician Lloyd Bitzer says that rhetoric is a mode for altering reality. When we plan to take rhetorical action, we ask questions about exigence or the, the need or problem, about knowledge gaps, about purpose, and also about kairos or the, the immediate social situation in which acts of communication take place. By the way, if kairos is also a newer word for you, um, we'll be digging into this concept in the workshop after lunch. Uh, but it's basically like right words at the right time. I'm going to show you what this planning process looked like for one of my students um, with some support for the process rather than like a real focus on the product. So starting with the need or the problem, in this case, he wanted to research food waste um, and look at um, produce, fruits and vegetables in particular. He wanted to know what small steps families could take on a daily basis to make a difference. And it, he wanted to provide families with practical tips for making incremental change, like just how do you do a shopping list where you're not buying stuff you're not going to eat? Or, or how do you store your food so that it lasts longer? Or how do you like figure out the difference between like the use by and the best by dates so you're not throwing something out when you maybe don't have to yet? Um, that question about Kairos, why is now the right time to act? He said, because the problem's only getting worse. You know, you can literally see the garbage piling up around us, and we don't want to miss our opportunity to make some of the changes that we can make today. So that's what the planning tool looks like. You have that in the um, materials folder for this session as well. You'll notice what's not on here yet is a consideration of audience. Asia Martinez, whom you might know as the author of the award-winning book, Counter Story, says, why do the work if it's inaccessible, right? R rhetorical action, we want to go somewhere, to go out into the world and to make a difference. And in order for that to happen, 
we, we need to think about the people that we're trying to reach, not only their interests, their values, their beliefs, but also their preferred forms of communication, right? Not just in terms of like genre, like where are you going to find these people? Is it going to be through social media? Is it going to be in publications? Is it going to be like in meetings or conferences? But also their language choices. And so thinking about, you know, one size fits all approaches to argument writing that either kind of impose formulas on students so that they can't think about accessibility or that impose language conventions on students so that they are only writing in academic English and not writing in the language that, that might be most appealing and compelling to the people who can make a difference. So those same kinds of rhetorical planning questions, bringing in audience this time. And, this really is about empathy. Um, I love what Linda Flower, who's a, a rhetorician I've learned a lot from, says about rhetorical empathy. I'm gonna show you that in just a moment. But that when we focus on our audience, we're really thinking about um, you know, listening and reading and speaking and writing with empathy. We're, we're going into not only what our audience feels, but also how they prefer to be communicated with. So we do this in order to make um, our goals more achievable. And we focus on the audience in relation to the problem we're trying to solve. So if we're brainstorming, OK, who can actually do something about food waste? Well, it's families. It's grocery store owners or managers, or, or it's food pantries. Whoever we want to focus in on, then thinking about the genres that can reach those folks. You have an audience analysis in the materials as well. And then here's what Linda Flower says. Take a look. And we're almost at our time, so I want to um, save just a moment for Q&A, but, but I'm around all day, would love to chat with you. Um, Reader-based writing, ultimately rhetorical of action, is about making sure that we're engaging with authentic audiences and getting our work out into the world, and that, and that writing is about this live negotiated exchange between readers and writers. So, let me just ask, um, actually, sorry, um, I'm going to skip ahead for a moment because I think that lunch is just about here. OK, um, we'll close with this. So rhetorical actions include things like visual rhetoric, like videos, like poetry, like social media, open letters, and argument essays. And when students are given the space and support to compose their own diverse arguments in response to authentic situations, their actions are impactful and inspiring. So I want to thank you all. I hope you have a lovely rest of the conference. Um, and we've got maybe a minute for Q&A, but I'll just tell you real quickly, you can find more resources on my blog. Uh, you can download the graphic organizers from Stenhouse if you go to their website as well. Um, contact me by email or DM me on Twitter. Um, and one last thought before lunch. Okay, thank you folks. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And Rachel and Tanya, are we going for lunch? Do we have a, yep, thank you. No, actually, since you've got a mic, I'm going to ask you to announce a couple of writers. I know you're going to get to go here, yep. or you I'm going to do it right now, yep. OK. So this is the, our door prize winner, right? OK, perfect. So I also have 
three copies of writing rhetorically um, to give out as door prizes. And the first winner is Erica Fairman. Erica Fairman? Where's Erica? Okay, oh, oh perfect, thank you so much. And next, um, Danielle Liege, Liege? Danielle, Oakland, Michigan Writing Project. Congratulations, Danielle. Thank you. And Jessica Momen. Woo! All right, Jessica. Thank you. She said she already owns the copy. Oh, okay. And she wants to know if you want to give it to another person. Oh, okay. Okay. We've got another one to give out. Okay. Okay. This one is going to Shanedra Noel. Shanedra? Woo! Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first poster. The argument moves is going to Michelle Devine. Michelle, yay, Michelle. Okay, and this is another poster. Okay, and then next poster goes to Renika Steed. Okay, Renika Steed. Kennedy Montessori. Okay, maybe we can put that off to the side. Um, next poster goes to Kristen Trail, W.E. Wilson Elementary, Kristen Trail. Okay. okay, then we have Jordan Stengel, Jordan Stengel. And Deanna Albright. Deanna. Okay. Okay, one more poster. Okay, one more poster goes to Carrie Theobald, Peoria, Peoria District 150. Carrie Theobald. <laughs> okay, uh, Catherine Williams, South Mississippi Writing Project. Yay, Catherine. Awesome. Nice. Okay, so first copy of You Have to Teach It Before You Can Test It goes to Miranda Yance. Miranda. Next goes to Deborah Gaddenberger, Louisville Writing Project. Okay, up there. Okay. Next one goes to Burn Riley, Glen Oak Community Learning Center. And then Rebecca Ingram, Jefferson County Public Schools. Rebecca Ingram. We see. Okay, do we have Rebecca and Burn? Yeah, okay. Get their books. And do we have, raise your hand if you want a book but you haven't received it yet. Is there anyone? Okay. Um, and then Suzanne Jackson. <laughs> okay. Lindsay Strobel, Southern High School. Lindsay. Is Lindsay Strobel here? Okay, we've got two more books, I think. Okay, Jessica Talley, Mount Washington Middle. Okay, Jessica, congratulations. And last book, 
goes to Jennifer Forseth, Vic Elementary. Jennifer. Okay, so lunch is served. Um, if you want to, you know, recess out to the area where the food is, and then Jean, we're eating back in here. And then we'll have the workshop after lunch.